everyone. My name is Sherry West, and I'm the founder and CEO of Lip Girl, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's conversation, Listen, Learn, Act, Racism in America, sponsored by New Canaan Moms and Too Pretty Brand. We'd like to give a special shout out welcome to our She Works interns today. Uh, I just first want to start by saying that at Live Girl, our mission is to build confident leaders and to contribute to a world free from both gender and racial inequality. The last few weeks have taught us that we must do more to accomplish this vision and to fight racial injustice. The work begins now as we provide a platform for teens and parents to listen, learn, and act. We can no longer live comfortably in ignorance of America's racial history. Our objective today is to have a meaningful conversation that leaves you with a clear call to action, to be a part of the solution to ending racism. For today's session, we have called upon two brilliant women. I'm gonna introduce them and then they will start the conversation and then we will open it up to you, the audience, for Q&A. We would appreciate if you would keep yourselves on mute until it's your turn to ask a question. So first, I'd like to introduce Cheyenne Tyler Jacobs, a, a dear, dear friend to Live Girl. She's a poetic activist, broadcast journalist, spoken word artist, and screenwriter. She is the founder and curator of the She Will Speak series, a platform to empower women through education, awareness, and arts to cultivate healing and change. Previously, she worked at the MLK Institute for Nonviolence, and she has published two books, including her latest, The Tragic Type of Beautiful. And interviewing her will be Live Girl board member, Dr. Vida Samuel, a scholar in women's studies and intercultural communication who teaches at the University of Connecticut at Stanford. Previously, she was the copy editor for the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture's exhibit program, Unveiling Visions, and co-editor of the companion book, Cosmic Underground, a grimoire of Black speculative discontent. In addition to serving on the Live Girl Board of Directors, Dr. Samuel has served for the Mandela Washington Fellows Program as an academic mentor for the annual Jackie Robinson Foundation Mentoring and Leadership Conference, and the National Black MBA Association of Westchester Greater Connecticut Leaders of Tomorrow program. We are so grateful to these two phenomenal women for hosting today's conversation. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Samuel to begin. Thank you so very much everyone for being here. And thank you Sherry for such a generous um, introduction. Um, the essential questions most people ask is what do I need to participate in an open, open conversation, open and honest conversation about race? With whom do I have this conversation? And how important is my voice in this conversation about racism without leading to feelings of anger, guilt, discomfort, sadness, and sometimes disrespect? Today, we hope you will find courage to, to participate in this conversation and acknowledge our collective responsibility for the world in which we live. Every day, we think of ways to save our world and environment with sustainable approaches to consumption habits. Ensuring, for example, groups of women no longer experience period poverty and the homeless population are provided shelter. The world that is rooted in our communities, our friend networks and our families. To make racism separate from these issues only lets us maintain an illusion that taking care of one thing ensures everything else is resolved. Getting to the homeless or working at a shelter are valuable motives toward a just world, but does not settle the issue of racial oppression, implicit bias, or microaggression. Having a white friend does not mean privilege is conferred upon a person of color. Similarly, having a friend of color does not mean one is a non-racist. People of color still must behave and dress in prescribed ways that do not reprodu uh, reproduce us in the negative ways often imposed upon all people of color. After 17-year-old Trayvon Martin's death in 2012, I concluded 
that a hoodie on a black, bo a black body was different, had a different meaning for a white body. A black body is circumscribed as suspicious, while a white body is interpreted as hipster. Clothing, I recognized, became another costume in performing whiteness and blackness. Ultimately, wearing a hoodie is associated with certain privilege for whites and danger for blacks. Shine and I are two women of color having a conversation that might often be decoded as having it in an echo chamber. We are not talking about race because it's easier for us. We engaged in this conversation because we feel qualified to provide you with the most accurate perspectives of our experiences and answers to your questions. It is important to preface this discussion, this discussion by telling you we do not speak for all people of color because our experiences are unique for sure. A person of color in Germany, Israel, Scotland, Russia, or the Caribbean might have experienced their racial might have experienced their racial identity in other ways, but might be treated in the same in the United States. So my experience of being a transnational St. Lucian who is a naturalized U.S. citizen is different from Cheyenne's experiences as a born U.S. citizen. My experiences at this stage of life are also different than Cheyenne's at this juncture in her life. And I point out these distinctions to highlight the uniqueness of each person of color, not to emphasize differences as a tool of division. We can only tell you how we're experiencing race at this moment in time in our brown and black bodies at our distinct ages and in the context of our national origin. Throughout this conversation, I will use the terms brown and black bodies, non-whites and people of color interchangeably to deliberate on how a majority race impacts racial and ethnic others. We encourage you to share with us your fears, experiences, vulnerabilities, and more importantly, your questions. A sustainable world really does depend on our ability to have this conversation often, reasonably, and acknowledge that even when we may not share similar narratives, our standing as human beings demands mutual respect as a human obligation. We must force ourselves to do equal amounts of the emotional work required for a more just, a racially just world. So let's get started. Cheyenne, as Sherry mentioned in her introduction, you are a poet, and I think it is important to set up this conversation with one of your poems, I believe is relevant for this conversation in the environment in which we live today. And by the way, yes, this is such a powerful book, The Tragic Type of Beautiful. And you had so many poems in there, so many writings that really deeply reflected this conversation, but I chose one. And I'd love for you to read some parts of uh, Black Girl Depression, if you can. Thank you so much. And everything you said to start off this conversation, Dr. Samuel, was beautiful. So um, yes, in my book, The Childish Type of Beautiful, I have a poem called Black Girl Depression that um, I will talk about maybe after. But just to give you what it is, we will start in um, the middle about stanza four. So Black Girl Depression. It is crying in the lower level bathroom at work because they didn't raise no baby. You better wipe your tears and walk back in there. You are a black woman and you will always, always work 200 times harder just to be treated half as good. Deal with it. Black girl depression. It is wondering when my brothers go out at night, will they be the victims of a wrongfully pulled police weapon and a victim of a wrongfully constructed system? So I have to sit there and wonder if they will be wrongfully taken from me. Black girl depression. It is knowing the same love I have when I wonder about the wrongful sins committed against my black men. Some will wrongfully speak against me when they say they do not date black girls because we have too much attitude. Black girl depression is me wondering when I walk into a room, is it my color or my gender you see first? And which one, if not both, will you try to make me surrender? Black girl depression is keeping a smile while carrying the dreams of your family, the stereotypes of society, and the pressure on your mind and back. And you better not ask for help. Black girl depression. I wish we spoke about you more. I wish you wrote more poems about you. I wish more importantly that we stopped implementing you in every black girl's brain from birth. We make her fight so many battles. Oh, black girl. I see you fighting, pushing and moving mountains. I see you trying to change the game while rolling the dice. I hope you know your feelings are not forgotten and your sadness and stress should never be written off. Oh, black girl, I see you and I'm sorry. Oh, black girl. 
I'm sorry that we have to deal with black girl depression. So. Yes, you know, I have to tell you, every time I read that, and of course when I read Lies and Conversations as well, those take me to a place of, um, of course, how we think of ourselves as women of color, right? Mm -hmm. The intersections of that, and of course, Black Girl Depression talks about that so fully. So, you know, you talk about um, some parts of your narrative. What are the three most important characters, uh, characteristics of your identity? And some of it you mentioned there being a Black woman, are two of them, um, in the order in which you consider them. And do these characteristics show up in your, po your poems? So I almost know the answer to that question. <laughs> yes, so um, the characteristics of, for me personally, being both Black and women almost on the same line, because I feel like those two are not mutually exclusive. Because I feel like when I walk into a room, they are both together, because separating them, I feel like, is trying to separate which part, as illustrated in the poem, are you trying to judge me for or talk with me about? And um, those two characteristics, I feel very much reflect, you know, in how people receive me. And I think one characteristic of myself that I see pour out into, as I'm sure if anyone has read my work, is my voice. Um, I've been told many times that um, my voice is very demanding and not in a bad way, but in a powerful way. I used to actually work with at-risk youth. And one day they were like, you know, your voice is very powerful. You know, when you talk, we just feel like we have to listen. And I feel even in my work, I always mention that, you know, this poem might not make you comfortable, but that's okay because my voice was made to push these conversations that are needed. So in your experiences, do any of these characteristics seem to produce any limitations for you and are those limitations grounded in racial bias? Yes, many of um, you know the characteristics from my identity to even the characteristics I would like to say I love about myself, my persistence, my, my voice, my you know, ability to just speak up, a lot of times are rooted in racial bias. You know, for example, a lot of time as women as a whole, we are seen as very emotional. You know, when being a communications major, I learned, you know, how when you look at articles, it'll be like, you know, she, she cried, she whined, she argued. But being a black woman, it's not taken from a sad point of view, it's taken as she's hostile. A lot of times my words are seen as hostile. They're seen as angry. Um, over these past three weeks, those have been the words I've, I've received many times. You know, you're being hostile, you're being angry. Being a black woman trying to achieve higher things, whether that be education, whether that be employment, often even told that, you know, maybe you're better working on the ground, you know, you're better on this lower level. And having people articulate those words to me and understanding that, you know, they're looking at me as both this woman that is Black and woman, and also rooted in this racial bias, I feel like is the aspect of, for many people, just being that check mark on their paper. You know, I, I think to be, I'm going to be 25 years old next week, and I have a clear understanding that many rooms I walk into, whether it be for jobs, whether it be for volunteering, I sometimes have a clear understanding because of their lack of support for people of color that I am most likely their person that's supposed to represent the person of color that they need in the room today. And having that understanding almost creates a sense of, okay, I am the Black girl in this room. And having to kind of create, you know, a sense of guard and a sense of just you know, I guess you can say a, a wall because you're trying not to let that get to you, but understanding that that's what the situation is. You know, you, you talked about just the vulnerabilities of having to be in that position. And I thought immediately about um, the 1619 project from the New York Times last, uh, last summer, which talks about the fact that, you know, people of color aren't uh, back, I guess in the 19th century, up until the 19th century, people of color weren't seen to be people who had vulnerabilities or even felt, right, physically felt anything. And so I actually felt the passion that you just talked about in the way that you talked about it. Um, and I saw what was happening. Um, I felt what was happening immediately. So when you think about yourself in that context, when you walk down the street, what do you wish others could see first? Um, and know about you based on the characteristics that you've described and the experiences you've described. 
I would love for people to actually see my light. And what I mean by my light, I mean, you know, my goal and my energy for change and happiness. A lot of times when people meet me, one of the first things I actually say is that um, they thought that I was very intimidating, thought I was very mean. They thought I was very, you know, a lot of people were scared of me when they first met me. And I think, you know, when we talk about identity, which is important for those of you who've seen me in person, I'm also 6'2". So I'm a 6'2", loud projecting Black woman in America currently, which already when you add height into an equation, height is, is a seen as authoritative, it's seen as power. So when I walk into a space, a lot of times it's, it's fearful when anyone who's met me knows, you know, I'm one of the first people who loves to have an understanding conversation. And going back to what you're saying, um, I love that point because when we look at systems, even such as our medical system, for example, the idea that, especially when you talk towards Black women, that we are so strong actually hinders us from getting the care that we need. And actually one of the biggest things I've, I personally even told people, you know, people that I love, care about, people who genuinely support me is like, don't call me strong. And I don't mean don't call me strong, like I'm not a strong, resilient person. I appreciate that. But in moments where I am allowed to be weak, don't try to, to, to say, well, you know, your community has been dealing with this for so long and it's like but we should not have to and even you know that narrative of being strong and being resilient really does you know keep um the community of color away from being able to just say hey we need help and i think over these past few weeks i actually wrote a tweet um about it um and you know, I, because I, I am, I'm 25 years old, I, I generally go back from speaking with academia to speaking with my regular slang terms, like, hey, if you're asking someone right now that's black or a person of color, if they're okay, I'm like, I'm gonna just tell you the answer is no, we're not okay. You know, and it is okay to not be okay, but understanding that we're asking for help. And I feel like because these narratives are often shifted off people of color, I know I would say over these past few weeks, I actually had to, reflect with myself and be like you need help like you 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 are asking for people to join this movement with you because you need the space to to grieve and feel and be like this is not okay what's happening in the world and to your point though it's it's also the reason why women of color or men of color actually families of color tend to avoid um, getting treated for depression right um, and of course we're at a place where everyone the entire world is feeling depressed about what's happening I want to talk about speech. You talked about your voice earlier, but I want to talk about speech as a site for stereotyping people of color. Many nations in the, dia in the African diaspora only know and speak the Queen's English. So when I'm told that I speak well or that I articulate, which is very different, I'm articulate, which is very different from you've articulated the thought well, right? Um, I ask for whom is speaking well reserved, right? Surely one ethnic or racial group does not have a monopoly or ownership of clear speech. So this is a question in two parts for you. Can you describe your experiences when you perform your work to mixed audiences? You gave us a taste of that early when you talked about, you know, when you walk into the room, everyone thinks that you've got a loud voice, projecting voice. Can you talk about those other experiences? Yes, yeah, so when I walk into a room and perform for um, a mixed audience, even for myself, one of the first things I actually do is scan the room. I'll be honest, so one of the first things I do is like, okay, what, what piece you know, am I going to perform today because I don't know how it's going to be taken in. And I think understanding that within my words, I am comfortable you know, going back, as I said before, with um, African-American vernacular English and, and just being able to speak like I'm talking with my friends, not having to use these big academia words, but also understanding for some people, they will allow those words to hide the message that you know they seek. And being able to um, honestly sometimes have to equip myself to be ready for conversations. I think something that I know when I perform my pieces, which is one of the reasons I sometimes give an introduction and a reflection at the end, is because I know sometimes when people hear the words, they might be like, oh my gosh, what just happened? And I actually have a workshop that I did um, two weeks ago on you know, niceness as a form of institutional oppression because I believe that we use niceness as a way to blanket being subtle. And I'm not subtle, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm one of those people that's like, I will give you shock factor because what I've learned from having friends in my life who are, you know, therapists and, and in corporate America and life coaches is even when you're angry, that's good because anger is a sign that you can take action. 
but being, you know, subtle and being, you know, numb to the feeling, you're not going to respond. So a lot of times in my work, I do try to, you know, put things in there that'll make you go, oh, like that, that kind of hit me in my heart because it might make you see things a little bit differently and then let's decompress and let's talk about it. And I'm fortunate, you know, that a lot of rooms I've been in, my words have been taken in. But as I said before, I think that's a, a really, you know, goes to the fact that I do try my best to give the intro and a reflection on like, hey, this is why this piece is important. And as you said before in your introduction, the conversation of race is not just reserved for people of color because we, this is an everybody's issue. And I actually am reading one of the books now, Hood Feminism, that speaks about the fact that when we talk about things like feminism, if we're not talking about basic human needs, then who are we talking about when some people don't even have that? And I love that you said that in the beginning because race for everyone involved is a basic human issue that not a lot of people are, are having the grounds to talk about and really have the equity that they need to get the resources they deserve. And, you know, I was having a conversation with someone who was so concerned about their animal, by the way, their dog. And we know that in the United States, animals are everything. They probably rule the houses. And I commented on the fact that, that sometimes that, that care isn't provided to other human beings. Right. And this is really to your point. So the second part of this question is, what do you hope a population who does not share your lived experiences take from your work? Because sometimes the messenger is examined more critically than the message. What I hope people take away from my work is understanding that the person that you see before you, you know, a lot of times people might not even know who I am. They're meeting me based off of, you know, she is this tall, black woman that's a poet going to perform but understanding like wow like she just said something that totally shifted my mind actually one of my newer pieces that I wrote um, based off Ahmaud Aubrey and Brianna Taylor and George Floyd um, was really talking to the point of uh, having to be stressed out because you know being black means not being able to walk outside and, and fear, you know, that something's going to happen to you. And currently I'm in Atlanta, Georgia right now, which I have people call me just about every day because they see what's happening in the news where I live, incidents that are happening five minutes away. And, you know, being able to see my lived share experiences and being able to see that I might smile and I might be happy. And I am a genuinely happy person. I believe we can have to change. I believe in community, but also understanding that there is it's almost like two identities and um i look at it even i was thinking about it after you know thinking reflecting on your question even as you asked that it's almost the idea of how a lot of people of color have to learn two histories when i was a kid i learned the history for school my dad even told me this is you know the american white centered and you know history that they're going to teach you and you're going to learn that you're going to answer the test just like that because you need to pass school but this is what really happened. And, you know, having to, even at the age of like six and seven, balance two different worldviews and almost hide one to not be like, you know, well, why is, why is you're making things complicated, but also understanding, you know, at an early age that, you know, the history that we're taught in grade school is not the history that we are taught now. And oh, like I said, over these past few weeks, I've had people come to me who are older than me. Like I didn't even know, you know, about Seneca Village, that that was burned down to create the Central Park, to create Central Park. And I'm like, yes, yeah, yes, it was. That was a flourishing black community that was burnt down. We, a lot of people didn't know about Black Wall Street. And so being able to have these, these things in my poems to show people like, hey, I might be 25 years old, but I know a lot about what's happening and you need to know about what's happening because you might see me as being angry and hostile, but I'm not angry and hostile. I just want someone to step up and be like, I understand why this is an important conversation. And certainly, um, and why history is important, right? Not just one history, but all histories, including your parents' histories, because that is just another narrative that you will live at some point. Um, I have an affinity to music. Um, Sherry knows this. Everything I do, I send some sort of a music reference. Um, and I have music references for just about every aspect of life. So like Marvin Gaye's Mother Mother, we all know the song. Bob Barley's So Much Trouble in the World, or War, which was taken from a a speech right, by Hale Selassie, of course, Nina Simone's Mississippi, Goddamn, 
uh, Billy Holiday, Strange Fruit, Steel Pulses, Earth Crisis, the entire album, and fellow Cody's What a No Get No Enemy, and this can get to be a very long list. Your writing reflects protest, at least based on everything that I've read. So can you explain the genesis of that protest and why you use poetry for that purpose? So I've been writing since I, honestly, I can remember, I can remember being eight years old in class and writing and writing for me was always a way to express my feelings. And I think being, you know, at a young age and so I'm in the category of being a millennial and I have a younger sister, so she is Gen Z. And I was actually talking with one of my friends, like, you know, millennials and Gen Z, we really do go hand in hand because a lot of us, like myself, we're kind of laying this groundwork for Gen Z to kind of come up and be like, hey, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna keep this going. So for me, I believe why writing became a part of my protest because I don't think the world was at a point yet to fully accept what is happening out of our window today. Like I, you know, at my sister 17, I at 17 would have never comprehended what is happening. I don't think I would have, you know, even known how to arrange a protest and you have people, you know, for example, Go Live Girl, you have, you know, young girls at, in high school doing what, it, you know, I'm trying to learn to do now. And being able for me to write about these things was my way of showing, well, hey, this is my call to action. And actually one of my first poems that I wrote that was a form of a protest that I'm, I'm trying to actually learn now is called The Now Generation. And it was about how, you know, we, we're giving millennials, my generation, all this media and all these different things, but then on the same token saying that we're not doing anything and we're lazy but it's like well, wait a minute you know we kind of came into this world and it wasn't all put together nicely for us either and what i realized what happened is you know because again i i love to speak but i know which surprised a lot of people sometimes um i get a little i lose my words when i when i when i talk almost in a speech form but when i write it down and when i say it in a poem I can't, I can't describe to people what happened. I, I can't describe to people what happens to me when I write, but it flows a lot better. And even, you know, with what's been happening, um, all I can do is write. And so I remember I had a meeting with my friends to talk about, you know, to just decompress what's happening. And they're like, well, Shine, what do you think? And it's like, before I say anything, I want to, I want to, which is exactly what you did for this. I want to read a poem because that's the best way I could tell you how I feel and that we can speak off of that. And I think when it comes to my writing and when it comes to poetry as a whole, art as a whole, I'm a big believer that art pushes the culture. It gives you a, a, like a stamp of what was happening at a certain point in time. It gives you something to revisit. You know, those songs that you listed, we list, I listen to those songs as a reminder, like, yep, that, mm -hmm, this is still very relevant today. And I can use that for my work for the next person. That's exactly it. And, you know, you talked about your 17 year old sister. Is it sister? Yeah. So if you knew then what you know now, what would your 17 year old self say to your classmates about how you experienced being in a brown body? Ooh, I would have said a lot. Um, but I think one of the biggest things I, I would have communicated is I think we mentioned it briefly before is the mental and emotional labor that goes into it. You know, the, the constant trying to live in a world but not feel like you were of the world at the same time. To, to feel like at any given point, I'm wondering, you know, did someone say this comment to me because I am a brown woman or did they say it to me just because it just happened to be a comment? You know, or thinking about things like I've heard, you know, you are pretty for a black girl. And it's like having people walk away and it's like, hmm, like, was, was that, should I have said something? Should, okay, well, the moment's gone now. And understanding what I understand now is just putting a name to what's happening. You know, I am happy that the friends that I have, we've come from all different walks of life. I have friends who are immigrants. I have friends who are white, black, brown, everything under the sun, different race, religion, creed. But being able to come to a table and be like, hey, this is this is what hurts me and this is what hurts you so how can we understand and i think what i would have done a lot differently is have people listen but to understand because at the end of the day as we said before i can't have anybody you know even us talking you know dr samuel we will never have each other experiences you know we will never be able to to, to live day by day what it is like but we can sit down and understand and give that space to be uncomfortable and to have the hard conversations where it's like, yeah, I can understand where that is hard and I can understand where we need change and I can understand where it's like, 
this is not working. And I think understanding duality, you know, some, a person, um, how I used to explain it to my youth, you know, you as a person could be good, but the system right now, you know, how it maybe sets us up, you might have more privilege with this person. And that's not a you problem, that is just the system in itself. And I think I would have explained those things to my classmates because like I said at the time, I didn't even know what those terms were. I didn't even know what a microaggression was. I didn't know what implicit bias was. But I think the biggest thing, and I would even say it to everyone listening, is you knowing yourself when something's not right. The one thing I can always say is I knew when people would say things to me, like this doesn't feel right. I feel like this was somehow a, a comment against me. And I think, you know, lastly, at 17, I would have gave myself the grace to know it's okay to feel like someone said something to you or did something to you that was against your identity. And not that it is okay, but it is okay that you are bothered by it and it is okay to take action because of it. And at the top of this, uh, this conversation, we talked about the woman of color not feeling any hood because that's how society, systemic racism works this way, right? Um, is that we're not capable of it. So I guess you're talking about the fact that at 17, these things might have been hurtful to you, but you couldn't say anything about it. Okay. So we have an audience of young women of all races, ethnicities, and culture watching this chat. Uh, would your messages to brown and black people be the same as to those of non-whites? I mean, if whites, so would your messages across the board, all ethnicities, all races, all cultures, be the same? So I think the central message of, you know, if you are experiencing these things or you see these things to put a name to it, I, you know, I think sometimes we, we see the word racism as being taboo when it's like, you know, it's taboo because we don't want to say it. Um, it's taboo because we don't want to acknowledge that maybe that friend that we had, you know, isn't exactly, you know, as open-minded as we think they are. Maybe they are problematic in the sense that maybe they have some anti-blackness in them. So I think in that sense of, you know, call it out, be, be a, a person of change, feel, you know, create the movement, I would say yes. Um, but I think my messaging would be different in aspects of, you know, and I've been having these conversations for few weeks with my with my friends um like i said I'm, I'm blessed and i do say blessed to have friends of all different backgrounds because i it teaches me you know about maybe okay well what can i do differently and what can i learn is that the conversations do need to be segmented though to i feel give space to the learning and for many communities the healing um because a lot of times what i'm working on right now for like my brown communities especially for example um and like we said in the call this is just my i'm not an expert this is my experience as someone black and American, also at being a millennial a, a lot of my friends um are of the afro latina culture and for a lot of them that Afro is new because there was a lot of anti-Blackness in their household. So for them to acknowledge that it's like, huh, I have this Black ancestry, I too am Black, but how do I translate that into my identity, into this movement? And I think you have to give space for that unlearning and learning, and as well as giving space for someone who is, you know, like you said, a, a U.S. born, American black person who is trying to understand like, okay, why are we still not understanding what racism is? And I think giving space, especially like in that aspect of black and brown, because I do know, like, as you said before, black, brown POCs are used interchangeably, but I do believe all these communities are still going through that same thing of what is anti-blackness, what is racism. You know, you can go to different countries right now, they're facing racism in their own light. And like I was explaining actually to a friend um, today, you know, I can't speak toward racism in a different country because, you know, I am not immersed in it, but if I go there, I could see what that looks like and then we could, you know, talk about what that is. Um, and what I would say to my, you know, non-black, um, folks or my folks who are the majority who are white is to is to understand that it's you know you you have to call it out as well you you have that duty to call these things out and also I would say to unlearn for yourself the aspect of are the things that you think experiences or are they based in systematic oppression you know do you not walk down that street because you had a bad experience or were you just taught that certain people live there and, and you shouldn't be around those certain type of people. And I think sometimes we, we get upset at ourselves for understanding like, oh my gosh, I think these things, 
but that's the only way we're gonna unlearn is if we get uncomfortable. And like I said, I, I've, I've been getting uncomfortable with a lot of people, helping a lot of people have these conversations. Even years ago when I was in college, I would have um, people message me like, hey, I never even thought that these things were an issue, but listening to how you're explaining it, it's like, I do, I need to have these conversations. So those would be the ways the conversation would be the same. But like I said, I think you need to give space to every community to really do the work within their own community as well, to come back to the, the drawing board. Because I would never want to take away from the resources or space, you know, my brown sisters need to, like I said, acknowledge maybe the anti-blackness in their own household. Because they're now recognizing what that is. And of course, recognizing that means doing the hard emotional work that we talked about earlier. And I just wanted to say that, um, yes, you're absolutely right that other countries might be experiencing oppression and oppression differently, right? And sometimes it's not based on race. It could be based on gender, religion, and class, right? Um, and lastly, I want you to give two important lessons for parents of racial majority children. So I believe two, two lessons I, I would have to go back to, um, the sitting down and, and education and the calling it out. Because at the end of the day, you know, for the black, brown and, and people of color, like I said, I can speak for my household, a lot of my friends' household, you know, and even my future children's household, we're giving double history lessons. We, we are trying to prepare, you know, I was prepared literally for, you know, this world that I would have to work 200 times harder in and understanding those answers while understanding who I am as a person. And I think a lot of times we have tried to not see racism, we try to use this term of being colored by when it's like, no, that's actually absolving you from doing the hard work. We see, I see color, I see color, I think color is beautiful, I understand that we are all different. And by absolving yourself, you're saying that you're taking yourself out of the equation, which again, you know, it, it's not fair to leave black and brown people to be the only ones to, you know, end racism. Or like you said, it's not fair to leave the people that are oppressed to end sexism, to end homophobia. The people on the other side, the people who are these allies have to do that work as well. So I would encourage you to have those conversations and be like, hey, like, you know, the, this is what's happening in the world. We're, we're seeing, we're actually seeing it in, in live action today. And I know that there's a lot of resources out there. And, you know, definitely, I just want to hit, hit it again is um, calling it out. If, you know, if you see your child doing something, helping them to understand like, hey, like, you know, that's not okay. That is, that is racist. You can't call someone that. You can't touch someone just because you know they have this certain type of hair you know you can this is called an implicit bias and understanding that you know you're not doing anything wrong but what you're actually doing is is helping them be able to be a good ally and helping to be them to be able to understand what's happening because like you said sitting in a classroom for for me uh, personally i'm actually i come from a white suburban area where um the majority did not understand what was happening and not understanding that, teachers not understanding that, you almost feel lost. And if you have students who understand what's happening, it helps when these incidents happen and you have people who have that knowledge as well. And I completely agree with that. So I just want to say thank you so very much for having such an informative and valuable chat. And I really very much enjoyed this exchange and I hope everybody else did as well. Um, and got a sense of what we're really asking as people of color and certainly as women of color, right? Because while we may not have, we may have the same needs as all people of color, we are women of color specifically. Thank you so very much. So, thank you. And I wanna thank both of you, Dr. Samuel and Cheyenne for allowing us to listen in and learn and unlearn from, from you both. Um, and so we're going to transition now and um, allow some questions from the audience. And what we'll do is um, if you have a question for either Dr. Samuel or Cheyenne, you may raise your hand and I will be moderating and calling upon you and unmuting you when it's your turn for a question. If you prefer to ask your question anonymously, you may message me. Um, I am Sherry West, the co-host of the Zoom, and um, I can read your question anonymously. But as people are queuing up for questions, I did just want to read something quick 
um, from Austin Channing Brown, who is the author of a brilliant book, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. I strongly recommend this book um, to, to, to everyone. She says that our only chance at dismantling racial injustice is being more curious about its origins than we are worried about our comfort. It's not a comfortable conversation for any of us. It's risky and messy. So with that, I really encourage you all to ask your questions. Don't hold back because this is what this conversation today is for. And we did purposely uh, format this as a meeting where everyone could be visible and ask their questions so that we can really get into, into that. Um, so with that, we will go to our question board and we will start with Nicole Weiss. Hello, I'm Nicole. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is, when you listen to the views of people who claim that racism does not exist anymore in America and often um, devalue the Black experience in America, how do you deal with that commentary and those arguments? And um, when they're with you or near you, do you engage with people who think like that? Do you debate them? or do you not um, give any of your energy to try and change their mind? Um, let me just start by saying, I think it's, it's important to have the conversation, but sometimes it's a losing battle and you have to know when that would be so. Um, there are people's minds that you just won't be able to change, but it is important to offer an intelligible aspect of your position always you know why are you supporting this group of people why is it important that other people do um, what are the risks to not doing so and if your audience cannot hear you they had not intended to ask that question in earnest anyway right i i agree wholeheartedly with dr samuel that was going to be the first thing i said um sometimes you have to sit back and even look at the conversation you're having and it's like do you want to have a conversation or do you want to argue and i always tell people i am not here to argue i have i my energy is very much protected i have engaged with people even in the last few weeks and was like oh i'm going to bed i'm not dealing with this you're talking to yourself come back you're still talking to yourself um but being able to if you want to have those conversations, you know, being able to understand what is also the goal, you know, what is the goal of your conversation? What are you trying to get this person to understand? And also, you know, if you need help recognizing when it is turning into an argument, when it is becoming into, you know, I'm just playing with your emotions. I always learned um, is when people start coming at personal attacks. So if someone's talking to you and now they're talking about your character, they're obviously using obscene words or trying to be, you know, ha um, just the word I'm looking for, trying to be violent in their speech, that's when they're just trying to create a, a situation. And at that point, it's like, hey, like, that's not what we're doing. Here's some, and also dropping resources, okay, too. I've honestly told people, you know, if we're debating about, you know, um, police reform or racism or, or the glass ceiling, I will simply sometimes drop an article and be like, here you go, you can read this. If you read it and you have questions, come back to me. If not, that's okay. Um, because at the end of the day too, you might talk to 10 people, but you might, you know, touch one person and that's okay if you only got to one person. And if you got to nobody, if anything, what I learned, at least you learned how to have this commentary because um, Dr. Samuel's amazing and she's been in so many amazing ar arenas. And, you know, I myself know I've learned um, from being in different arenas, but also by having these commentary with people. So it also helps you to know how to have these conversations. So don't shy away from it either. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we'll go to Linda Peterson. Hi, um, I'm Linda. I go to the Genesis program, which is sort of like an offshoot of Wilton High School. So I was actually at a protest recently and I saw a sign and it really stuck with me. And it said, is this just performative or are you actually going to do something? So what, so what can I, what else can I do? What more can I do? Well, this I don't know. Well, I'm very happy that um, I love that question, actually, because I was just talking about that reason, uh, recently with performative activism versus, you know, activism. So 
I think the biggest thing is number one, understanding for yourself, like, why are you doing this? And I think centering the topic at hand. So if the topic at hand, like right now we're talking about Black Lives Matter, it's being able to understand, like, here are some resources. And I like to say, it, you know, I, it's not, look at me, I'm doing this. It's like, here is the topic, here's the issue, here's how, here's what you're doing. And understanding that, and this is for anyone, you know, um, you don't have to be a frontliner. You don't have to be at the protest to be making a change. It's, it's emailing people. It's honestly being on this call right now, it's learning. You know, sometimes before we even have these conversations, it's understanding that knowledge. Um, there are petitions to sign, workshops, to go to, I'm actually hosting my niceness as a form of oppression again. And I would also just encourage you, you know, to, to learn more. And um, if you have any organizations, even with where you are that are doing, you know, maybe more, even if it's not in Black Lives Matter, whether whatever that activism is that you're passionate about or that you wanna do, find out what that is and get involved with it. Um, and like I said, thank you for that question because I've been talking about performative activism for a while. So I was like, ooh, yes, I love it. <laughs> and Linda, I just want to add that um, sometimes it's really just enough to say to someone that what they've said is either not accurate, doesn't uh, properly represent a group of people, or that you just cannot have a relationship with someone who feels and thinks that way, right? Um, and I think, again, we talked about the fact that emotional work has to be done in the space that's part of doing the emotional work. And by the way, I'm not saying to lose your friends. Don't do that. Thank you so much. So next we have Kate Reeves. Hi, thank you both for speaking. Um, I am always so inspired by listening to you both. So, um, but I particularly loved how you talked about intersectionality um, because Lately, I've been feeling like intersectionality is very much just like a side topic, like it will be the one chant at the march, but like never mentioned again, or it will be like one post on social media, but never really part of the main conversation. And so I was wondering how you build intersectionality into the primary momentum of the movement, um, because I think so often it feels like it's like, oh, like, here's a side note, but obviously we know that, like, violence against trans women and violence against women and violence against so many other intersections are, like, such a critical and central part of violence against Black folks in general. So um, I was wondering if you could touch on that. Okay, that is such an awesome question, and welcome back. Happy summer. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about a lot in my classes is that um, it's not just one person who's ever impacted by this. And as I prefaced this conversation, it was, is that, you know, this is, we're talking about human life, human dignity, human issues. So a woman of color may not be just a woman of color. She might be also at the intersection of being differently abled. She might have another intersection of being in a non-majority religion, part of a non-majority you know, way of thinking. Uh, she could also be trans woman. A sexual orientation could be um, not, you know, not cisgender. Um, so I think in, in many ways, it is a bigger conversation. Right now, we are framing this whole thing in terms of race because of certainly what we've seen on television and the experiences we've been having um, and of course this country's history of race but I believe there is something to be done at every intersection of race yes so you know part of what Alice Walker said is that you know when she talked about womanism is that it's not just feminism it's almost it's it's it is that we understand the entire black family is implicated in what happens to the man or to the woman so I think it is important to keep thinking about race in that way. So when you do see someone who is differently abled, or well, by the way, even um, an, an elder adult who is a person of color, you know, how do we think about this person? How do we think differently about that person? Uh, somebody who's not well, um, somebody who has, who was depressed and who is a, a black woman, we have to figure out or think about more than anything else, that there is 
something that's happened systemically that is causing this level of trauma. Right. So thank you so much for that question. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add something to that. Um, I, I think that, yeah, that, that question was amazing um, because I know when we talk about Black lives at the intersex, a lot of times, as you're saying, it sometimes is a conversation that goes exactly like you said, like, oh, and this person, oh, and this person as well. And I think one of the ways to also understand why sometimes these conversations don't get had, uh, don't, you know, are not being had, because I'm also a big person on, you know, you have to sometimes understand why they're not being had to understand how to have them is because what we preference even, you know, in the interview is that you have things such as racism and the patriarchy and, you know, ableism all playing against each other um, to what Dr. Samuel was speaking before. So even something I learned was a lot of times when we preference, for example, um, maybe black literature, a lot of times, or, or black activists, a lot of people talk about the Malcolm X and the Martin Luther King Juniors who are amazing. You know, I, I, I love Malcolm X. However, we don't talk about the Ida B. Wells. We don't, we don't talk about the Angela Davis. We don't talk about, you know, um, the Marshas. We don't talk about these people sometimes who are also part of the movement, which makes it seem like this movement for many people are only in the segments of a certain person. So I think also when you read and you learn about the work that other people within the intersex are doing, it shows how it's like, hey, like everybody has a hand and not only does everyone have a hand, everybody needs that support. Um, so I know that's something I've recently read from, um, I thought um, one of someone that I love to, to listen to is Eric Hart, who says, you know, look at who you're reading, look at what you're watching and really, you know, reflect on it. So that might also help you as well you know, maybe, you know, just expanding that a little bit, not to say that you're not, but if you're talking to someone, maybe be like, hey, have you also read this person? Have you looked at this person? Do you know who this person is? Okay, we have a few anonymous questions that I will insert here. The first one is for Cheyenne. Um, can you talk about, as a Black woman consuming a lot of traumatizing media right now, how to balance taking care of yourself and remaining present and informed? So I think, uh, thank you, that, that's, uh, I love that question. Um, and I think it's an answer and a conversation that needs to be had is understanding that, you know, you don't need trauma to be informed. And I think a lot of times, you know, um, especially me being who I am, a lot of people it, love my opinion. They want to know what I think. They want to be like, well, how can I help? And I've told people, you know, you don't have to send me the video of, of you know, someone dying to, to get that answer. You know, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to see that. So I think balancing it is number one, communicating that with people. You know, I'm, as we, you know, said in the beginning, I run um, She Will Speak series and my team is an amazing team. And, you know, way before, you know, sometimes we would just like switch different media articles we saw back and forth. But as of recently, you know, I had to set up that boundary like, hey, thank you so much for informing me of what happened. But it's like, this is a lot for me to take in. You know, I don't want to see these images. I don't want to see this. You know, you can tell me what's happening, but I need to balance that because it's a lot. Um, and I think being able to understand the work that you can do at a certain time, you know, um, which I said it before, you know, you might be a frontliner, you might be someone who's having a conversation, you might do a workshop, you might be someone who, who could do it all. But understanding that, you know, this week, you might be at a protest, but maybe next week, it's like, hey, my protest is smiling. Because that's another thing too, you know, my protest is being happy, it, it is it is spending time with my family, it is creating art or whatever that may be. Um, but I think the biggest thing I would like to say is creating boundaries for that. Because like I said, I know I've had people who love my opinion and I'm happy that they do. Um, but I know I'm someone who I can't take a lot of those things in because it, it will heavily affect my mental health. Thank you, Cheyenne. So next we have Abnerlene. Hi, um, thank you guys for being here. My name is Abnerlene and um, I go, I'm a SheWorks intern and I go to JM Wright Technical High School in Sanford. And my question is for Cheyenne. Um, this morning I saw your Instagram post about, you know, Black women and how we deserve more in terms of us always um, being in the front lines and fighting injustices of all kind. And <clears throat> my question for you is just as Black women, how do we support each other? And how do we stand up for each other when, and when pe other people obviously aren't? 
and how do we stand by each other and engage other people to stand with us? Thank you so much for that question. And I believe how we stand with each other is being able to understand um, what Dr. Samuel said before, that even though we are both black women and you know, this con like your question is towards black women that our black experiences are very different and understanding though that at this current time, we are sharing you know this shared trauma and again it, it could be something as simple as if we need to cry let's cry i know um with some of my friends we literally got on a zoom call just like this just to talk just to talk and then you know we went in our group chat and we talked about hair and we talked about this and we talked about that and we created those boundaries where it's like if you need to have those conversations let's have them but let's also not forget that it's like you know let's try to look towards the light or let's try to maybe have these moments. So I think supporting each other in both contexts of that trauma and, and allowing, you know, that time and space, but also, you know, if somebody is, you know, trying to need that push to maybe vibrate a little bit higher, whoever can do that, let's see what that looks like and how to engage other people. Um, I've been having these conversations, like I said, you know, for the last few weeks, even before these last few weeks and, you can, you, it's like they say, you can lead a horse to the water, you can't make a drink. Um, because you will exhaust yourself sometimes trying to get people to understand. But what I've actually come to, to realize even within these past few weeks is that I think it is all, it is all about unlearning, which I'm happy that this is the title is unlearning and learning. You know, if you never understood that Central Park was a flourishing black community, you might not understand why there's so much anger, you know, or so much, you know, just, just, protest because it's like well we understand that this is what was ours and it was taken away from us so i think you know giving folks the education even even if it's not your you know your commentary like hey read this and understand that and and or ask me questions i i found that actually helps a lot i've actually had a lot more people come back to me with i didn't know that this happened in history and it's like yes it did so can you understand why a b c and d are happening today and it's like yes so i think that might be helpful and i believe again setting up boundaries because i'm a big person like emotional labor is labor it's a lot of labor you don't want to just give your trauma and i think it's very important for us as you know women as a whole but especially women of color to feel like we don't have to give out our trauma you know my trauma should not be an example as why you should care like we should care because of x y and z um so i hope that that helped you um i hope you know and, and i hope that you do have that space where you can be you know happy or at least feel like if you need to cry you can cry or be vulnerable because that is very important at any given time but especially at this time thank you Okay, we definitely need to turn this conversation into a conversation series because we do have several more questions, but we are out of time and we wanted to end with something very special, which is an original poem that Cheyenne wrote called SIS. And I won't give away what the SIS stands for, but I can tell you that I shed many tears the first time she read it to me. And so we asked her to share it again today in closing. Yes, yeah, so first I, I would like to say, which I'll probably say it again, but thank you so much, Galibro. Thank you, Sherry, for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Samuel, for having this conversation um, and everyone on this call, um, because again, and I know a lot of the questions are like, what is, how do I make change? You know, how do I have these conversations? This is how we start. It's, it's being uncomfortable. And sometimes a safe space is a safe space to be uncomfortable and to have hard conversations, you know, without feeling like you're being judged or without feeling like, you know, you can't, you know, just be real with what you have to say. So I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining this call because I think this is what we need more of um, in the world as a whole. We need more people willing to be uncomfortable. Um, so yes, I'm gonna, um, this poem I think I read, Time is an illusion for me at this point, but I read it at some point um, for Go Liberal, I think a few weeks ago. Um, so yes, S-I-S. Um, sis, let me hold that bracelet. Sis, did I tell you he texted me back? Sis, what are we doing tonight? You see, when I say sis, just know my tongue is cutting through any barriers of division because cis does not see race, gender, or religion. You see, cis is not cisgendered, neither is it skin deep. Sis, it's not only a compliment, 
It is a title. It is a community bridge connecting those across generations. When I say, sis, just know that is the highest honor you will ever receive from me. Sis, well, sis, you see, we gotta talk. Although these pillow fights, gossiping nights, nail painting and shopping sprees are all cool, well, sis, I I got a bone to pick with you. You see, you want to be my sis, but you're sitting quiet. You want to be my sis, but you're turning a blind eye. You want to be my sis, but you don't seem ready to do the work, sis. You see, when I say sis, I'm talking about standing in solidarity. You see, my sisters who are on the front lines with me, my sisters who are breaking the system with me, my sisters who believe that I matter. You see, I wish I could not see your silence because acknowledging your complacency within this world hurts. But my skin is not something I can hang up at night and my gender pronouns are ingrained in my spirit. And I know some folks look at me as a weapon just because of my skin, just because of my voice, just because of my passion for change. Sis, you can't love me, but then hate my movement. You can't love me and not speak up when you see me bleeding. You can't love me when it is convenient. Everybody wants to be sis when it's convenient. Well, I don't just give out titles to anyone. Sis, look outside your window. This world is hurting. I am hurting because as a black woman, I cannot shed a tear, although my oppression is at the intersections of two wars, for I am both woman and black. I can't shed a tear because people come to me for support, for education, for understanding. I cannot cry because, well, honestly, sis, I don't think I have any more tears left. You see, sis, being a leader is not always fun. The head is heavy for she that holds the crown, sis. You need to speak up, standing in solidarity. We all want to sit at this table, but still in 2020, we don't have enough seats. We are fighting over chairs. We are fighting over plates, falling over each other, trying to get a meal when they're just throwing crumbs at us, sis. Sis, I want you to be here, but I will not wait for you to look up and acknowledge my existence. Sis, this is our hour to truly come together. Sis, it really is not just a compliment, it is a title. Sis, I know my voice can cut deep, but don't tone police me because I don't want to cater to the insecure anymore. Sis, it's me today, you tomorrow, us by next week. Sis, our experiences may be different, but I believe our goals, our mission, our creed, at its basic human level is aligned. Sis, standing in solidarity, I ask you to stand with me, not against me. But most importantly, I ask, I demand that you especially do not try to stand silent in my presence because your silence is complacency. And anyone silent about my life, anyone silent about my truth, anyone silent about our community, well, you can't be my sis. Every day we are writing history and I hope we will align. I hope you will be standing with me. And I hope by the end of it all, at the end of the night, we will all be on the right side of history. Thank you. So thank you, Cheyenne, Tyler, Jacobs, you are brilliant. Um, for everyone, her books are available on Amazon. You may follow Cheyenne at She Will Speak and at the She Will Speak series. And you may support her advocacy work at She Will Speak on Venmo. Um, I wanna thank you, Dr. Samuel, for your leadership and for your friendship and for, for facilitating this very important conversation. Um, and just thank you all, everyone, for joining today's conversation. Thank you for committing to do the work of anti-racism, which is the work of treating other humans better. Thank you for imagining a world of true racial justice. Um, we hope that you, uh, if you learn something today, that you will support Live Girl, that you will consider supporting She Will Speak. Um, there is information in the chat bar on how you can reach both of us, because the work really begins now. So um, we appreciate your support, and we need your support now more than ever. So thank you, everyone, for joining today's conversation. And it looks like the consensus is that we definitely need to make this a conversation series. So um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be following up with all of you on that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.